Hi, this is Mark Wade from CenterCityCondos.com at Prudential Fox and & Roach. And then in this podcast, I'd like to really pick apart and discuss Waterfront Square. Now, a lot of times, you know, when I tell people about Waterfront Square, they're like, uh, Waterfront what now? You're going to know this building because as you come over the Ben Franklin Bridge from New Jersey and you look to your right up the river, you see those three new high-rises. That's Waterfront Square, 901 North Penn Street. Okay, now here's what I believe to be true and correct about the the complex, and I do know a little bit about it because I live there. So uh, I like to think that I'm the resident big brain. But anyway, um, okay, there are currently three buildings with plans for two more to be built. Now, when will the next two be built? Who knows? The next building cycle, when will that come around? Uh, Five to ten years, I'm going to guess. But in the three buildings that currently exist, there are 483 units per trend MLS. Um, Now, the first two buildings that were built are the closest to the water, that's the Regatta and the Peninsula building, that were uh, built and started to be marketed in mid-2006. Those two buildings are sold out. Um, Now, what's interesting, and in in just one second, I'm going to come back to the Reef building, which is really the point of this podcast. The Reef building is the new building, the building in which I live, um, that has... uh, not performed, uh, I guess I would suggest perhaps up to expectations as far as sales, prior sales. Um, but anyway, let's talk about the first two buildings real quick. They sold out. Uh, there's a very popular sized unit in the first two buildings. It's a two bedroom, two and a half bath. And when it was originally sold out, you know, in the mid 2006, 2007, the prices for that, the two very popular two bed, two and a half bath with parking style, you know, about 1,500 square feet, sold originally in the mid sixes to the high sevens. Then the market falls a little bit. And what happened uh, in the past 18 months was there were a number of short sales and or foreclosures, REO properties, which means, you know, Bill and Susie moved to Walla Walla, Washington, and their company bought it and sold it on the market, the secondary market through a third-party seller there. Um, But what happened was there were kind of a string uh, in the past year year or so of these very particular popular two-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath condos that sold in the mid, uh, mid to very low fours. In fact, one of my buyers, Michelle, uh, I sold her a 1,568 square foot unit on the 13th floor in one of the two original buildings, two beds, two and a half bath with parking. She bought it for 404,000. Now, there were a number of those in a row. Let's say there were five or six of those in a row. What that effectively did, in my opinion, was it reset the p- pricing structure for the building, not only in the eyes of a buyer coming in, because, of course, a buyer is going to look at recent comps to see what is going on in a building to know where to place a bid, but also in the eyes of an appraiser, because I know very few appraisers who would see, let's say, the last four or five consecutive sales on this popular style unit to sell in the low fours and then magically appraise one for in the mid sevens. It just doesn't happen like that. So in the first two buildings, I think it's fair to say that uh, the, the pricing structure of the first two buildings have been reset. Now, the third building comes along, the Reef Building, the building in which I live. The developer, seeing what had happened as far as the reset pricing structure, or, or maybe he didn't see, or maybe it doesn't matter, but those prices were set much lower. In fact, the the popular two-bed, two-and-a-half bath with parking were mostly spread out in the fours and mid to low five range. Um, But what's interesting is, uh, you know, the seller, I believe, lowered the prices to match the current market. And somewhere along in that selling point, he had an auction, hired accelerated marketing partners, a a wonderful, uh, you know, if you own a big building, you want to auction off some units. Call Accelerated Marketing Partners up in Boston. They did the Phoenix, they did the Murano, and they did Waterfront Square. So Accelerated Marketing Partners comes along, and they provided a lot of great uh, visibility for the building, visibility that I believe had been lacking prior to this auction. Uh, so they auctioned off you know, 38 or 40 units, what have you. Um, 
But then the uh, after that happened, the market had you know the from what I'm seeing from the multiple listing service, I'm seeing that the reef building then kind of stagnated as far as the sales were concerned, and then. Although I don't know exactly the the uh, how the legalities how it works, what happened was, and this was just recently in the past, uh, you know, late 20, 2011, early twenty twelve, the developer walked from those units that were unsold, and the bank took them back. You know, whether they went through a sheriff sale or went to foreclosure or a cow jumped over the moon, I don't know exactly. Again, the the lawyerly semantics of how all that works, but. The building is now in receivership uh, by Grasso Holdings. Now, I know some folks over at Grasso Holdings, and I think, you know, this, there's a gentleman over there by the name of Ryan who I have a lot of respect for. Uh, I think that uh, Grasso is going to do a wonderful job, and, and so far from what I've seen, has done a wonderful job in managing uh, the reef building and, and looking out for the best interest of uh, the current owners and things like that. Now, the reef building in particular, why did it? Founder, if you will, why did it go into receivership and uh, all that kind of stuff? Well, you know, I bought there because I love the building, I love the complex. There's has it has so much going for it, and you know what? My problem is I know every gosh darn condo in this town, up one side and down the other. I know the finances, I know what's selling, I know why it's selling, why it's not selling, I know who's buying and who's not buying, and why they're buying and how much they're paying, and how much they're not paying, and what they're paying the extras for. And and I know, you know, it's just unfortunate that I just know everything, you see. <laughs> uh, I bought at the Reef Building because uh, we, I believe we got an excellent price. We got two car parking. We've got this, ta you know, my taxes are $180 a year for the next 10 years. We have these big storage units on the third floor. Uh, did I say two car parking? Yeah, we got a two bed, two and a half bath, a big balcony. We overlooked the river. You know, it had everything going for it. Now, you'll hear me often piss and moan in my podcast and my articles that I write that be weary, wary, weary, whatever, of uh, condo buildings that are non Fannie Mae warrantable, have a low owner occupancy ratio, or the building is kind of stagnant in its sales. I, I do caution my buyers about that. So, why did I jump on? Why did I go against every rule I, I piss and moan about? Well, Mick Jagger once said, it's okay to let yourself go as long as you can get yourself back. And under that theory, I believe that for what we paid, for what we got, if one day I go crazy and I decide to get on a rocket ship and move to the moon, I can get back what I paid for this condominium. I'm not looking to be a millionaire. It's not like I paid X amount and it's worth three times that a month later. That wasn't the idea. I've got a beautiful surroundings on 10 acres with the doorman and a front gate guard and the two-car parking and this beautiful swimming pool and just stunning grounds. So anyway, so I think I can get out whole. So really, to me, there was no risk in that investment. I've got a roof over my head. I absolutely love the place. But really, let's look at the reef building and why were the sales slow and what caused it to go into receivership? Well, you know, I, I can't read the developer's mind who, who lost it or gave it back to the bank. But I think it's fair to suggest that things like this happen due to, due to the lack of prior sales. Now, why were there a lack of prior sales? Well, most people you talk to will um, suggest, most people I talk to in the real estate community, be it buyers or other real estate agents, people who write uh, uh, locally uh, for uh, some of the publications here in town about real estate, would suggest that it was just a piss poor marketing effort on the behalf of whomever. I mean, you know, it could have been the, the developer, it could have been the budget he had, it could have been the prior realtor who had it, it could have been a number of those factors, it could have been in the man on the moon, it doesn't matter. The fact is that there were a number of things lacking here in terms of marketing that I think caused a lack of awareness, not only in, in the real estate community as far as buyers are concerned, but in the real estate community as far as realtors are concerned. Because go to the multiple listing service. If you went to the multiple listing service prior to the receivership, you found that, you know, okay, let's say the building has 150 units left to sell. There were only three units in the multiple listing service. All three of those units had the exact same photos. So you really didn't know when you went online you really didn't know what you were buying. You didn't know what the views were like. You didn't know what the interior condition looked like. It was just, you know, they, uh, the 
there were very few ads in the paper. The viral marketing just blew. I mean, it was just the worst, in my opinion. You know, there were no 3D floor plans. There were no podcasts. There were no virtual tours, no videos, no buyer testimonials. The blog on their uh, Waterfront Square website was basically abandoned. I mean, there was just no real mar viral marketing to speak of. And no real, again, no real awareness in the real estate community from realtors or buyers that the place was for sale. Now, a, a lot of buyers that I've talk, spoken to and a lot of real estate agents will say, gee, Waterfront Square is a little far out from Center City where buyers can't really walk to, you know, the grocery store and the, the liquor mart and the, you know, the uh, restaurants and things like that. Well, you know what? I hear the exact same thing said about Naval Square. But Naval Square is not uh, having any problem selling. As a matter of fact, you go to show one of their listings in the multiple listing service, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, we're building it now. There's an eight-month wait. Um, so, it, again, why did Waterfront Square uh, suffer the way it has uh, via a lack of sales? Because, in my opinion, it certainly wasn't price. I mean, you got to see what you can pick up there in, in a two-bed, two-and-a-half bath, brand new, nobody's ever lived in with a view and the parking and the tax abatement and everything's gone. It is not the price. Uh, in fact, the dollar per square foot there, I think, is exceedingly fair. But, you know, it gets back to the prior marketing efforts. And I just think, uh, again, they were piss poor. You know, they, they really didn't have not done a lot as far as the model units are concerned. So when buyers walk in, generally what or, or what I felt when I walked in, I was just looking at a white box. There are four walls, you know. Now, it's got great floor to ceiling windows, but there's no imagination. There's no visual. There's no wow. There's no wow factor to a lot of these units. At least that's how I felt when I looked at my unit. You know, they say you don't sell the steak, you sell the sizzle. Well, I think uh, the Waterfront Square Reef Building lacks sizzle. You know, um, here's the probably the most interesting point that I can highlight what I'm suggesting here. At the auction, there were two units, two almost identical units, 1401 and 1001. 1401, they used as a model. They did a real pretty coloring in there. They brought in some neat lighting fixtures. They did the California closet look. You know, it just had this wow, and it was decorated nicely. It had an emotional, I mean, it really was stunning. It was a stunning unit. As opposed to unit 1001, which was a white box with no paint, no upgraded this, and no upgraded closets, no upgraded lighting. So let's assume that the cost to upgrade 1401 as opposed to 1001 was $10,000. You know, because we're talking lighting, we're talking paint, and we're talking closet inserts. At the auction, unit 1401 sold for $136,000 more than unit 1001. Now, under the theory that even a blind man knows when the sun is shining, I mean, come on. Uh, are you kidding me? I mean, if that doesn't tell the story and paint the picture of why there are a lack of prior sales and market, you know, marketing whatever at the reef building, I think it, it has to do, let me back up a little bit. If there's a lack of uh, reasoning for the lack of prior sales, I'm going to suggest, based upon what I see, what I hear, and what I kind of deduce in my own brain, that... Uh, the lack of sizzle and the lack of marketing has contributed to the lack of sales at Waterfront Square, and you'd have to be a goof not to agree with me on that. I mean, come on. Um, Naval Square, uh, the Murano, uh, Western Union, they all have decorated models, and they all show like a dream, and they visually pull you in. Now, Waterfront Square, the reef building, currently has one Unit 1505 currently has a model, uh, you know, not to knock anyone, I mean, but I think it is a little on the weak side as far as the emotional office concern. I think they could have done a lot more there. But, you know, all in all, you know, there are a lot of problems that can be easily solved at Waterfront Square, and price is not one of them. And neither is the fact that it's off the beaten path. I mean, Naval Square overcame that, but... Waterfront Square has yet to overcome that little hurdle. And I think there are some simple solutions, simple solutions tried and true and tested, that can overcome that obstacle. Uh, but nobody's, uh, somebody would just have to grab the marketing, excuse my French here, by the nuts and stir it up a little bit. I think, and if done so, done properly, I think Waterfront Square would become the next hottest building, uh, selling building in town. Because again, in my opinion, it's not the pricing, it's not the, it's the marketing or prior lack thereof.
Um, and not to be a big brain, but you know, if I had this building, I could sell the crap out of this building uh, because I live there, I believe in it, and I think that if I could uh, get, hell, if, if I had this building and I had to decorate a unit, I would do that because you know what? That's what sells units here in downtown Philadelphia. The price is so well, This this is it's a great complex. Um, and somebody just has to, you know, kick the marketing up five or six notches in this building to get these units to sell, to get the attention and the awareness from the real estate community that Waterfront Square deserves. Uh, so anyway, there you, there you go. This is Mark Wade rambling on and on. Questions, comments, or concerns, you pick up the telephone, you push the, the buttons that are on the front of your telephone, 215 215- Five two one one five two three, and let's chat. And if you have any uh, questions, comments, or concerns, ideas, love to hear them. Thank you so much. Bye now.